Welcome to another edition of the Morning Devotional. My name is Pastor William Hill, the pastor of Providence Presbyterian Church located in Evansville, Indiana. Today is Thursday, September 21st, 2023. This is edition number 163 of season eight. We're continuing our study of the Westminster Confession of Faith. We're still in chapter 29 of the Lord's Supper. Today we will consider paragraph number four. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, as we come now again to these very important doctrines, these important truths as given to us in your word and summarized by this, this historic document that has been given to us to help us better understand your word, we pray that as we consider the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we would understand all that it offers to us, the implications uh, surrounding it, all the matters related to it. We pray that your spirit would teach us and guide us, and we ask that you'd forgive us indeed for the ways in which we presume upon your goodness, uh, and the ways in which we stray from your commands and fall short of your glory. We pray that you'd be merciful to us, help us even now as we uh, read your word and consider it, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, we come now to paragraph number four. Uh, yesterday, we considered the right administration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper that is, that is done through the ministers of the gospel to declare the word of institution to the people to pray and bless the elements of bread and wine. Um, we considered matters related to what it means by those that are not present in the congregation. Today, we come to a matter that has generated, again, some discussion uh, within, the reformed, with, within Reformed Orthodoxy. And that is matters pertaining uh, to the sacrament in certain or unusual circumstances. So, paragraph number four, private masses or receiving the sacrament by a priest or any other alone, as likewise the denial of the cup to the people, worshiping the elements, the lifting them up or carrying them about for adoration and the reserving them for any pretended religious use, are all contrary to the nature of the sacrament and to the institution of Christ. Let's first consider this matter regarding private masses or receiving the sacrament by a priest or any other alone. This is uh, something that I've actually been appointed by my presbytery. I'm the chairman of a study committee that is looking into the exact understanding of this phrase and just how we might then use the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in cases extraordinary um, in situations in which a person is providentially hindered from being in the public worship of God. Remember, we just noted in paragraph 3 that it is not to be given to any that are not then present in the congregation or not then present with God's people in public worship. Well, what do you do in a situation in which you have an individual who is providentially hindered uh, from God's worship for reasons uh, by no fault of their own. Perhaps they're infirmed, perhaps they're shut in, perhaps they have a long-term illness that prevents them from being with God's people. Again, it's an act of providence. It, uh, it is not what the person would want, but it's the situation they find themselves. And of course, we know from 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 16, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And there are other references, of course, that speak to the fact that the Lord's Supper should be done under the rubric or umbrella of the corporate gathering of God's people. It should be done together as one body, the body of Christ locally expressed. But there are cases in which... Um, there, uh, there are circumstances in which uh, would require me as a minister of the gospel to give the Lord's Supper to those who are not able to, under usual, normal circumstances, to be part of the congregation. So what is it that I would do? Well, what I would do and what we're seeking to advocate our presbytery to agree with is that I would um, announce the fact that we are going to have a special worship service, very stripped down, very minimal, uh, for the person uh, wherever they may be. They may be in a nursing home, they may be in an assisted living center, they may be in their own home. I'd bring an elder or two with me and we would have, uh, as I mentioned, a stripped down worship service. There'd be a call to worship, maybe sing a hymn. Um, there'd be a scripture reading and a, and, a, and a very short sermon of which then I would 
administer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to the individual. Now, I do this within the congregation. There's more than just me there. That would constitute a private mass or a private serving of the meal. But I would bring those who are willing to come within the, the bounds of propriety. That is to say, if it's someone's home, you know, obviously we can't have 80 people showing up in their living room. But get a small sampling of the congregation, three or four people, maybe my wife, a couple elders, a deacon, and two or three other members, whatever the case may be. Um, this way you avoid the prohibition of serving the meal alone. But notice also it still must come under the rubric of worship. It comes under the umbrella of the preaching of God's word. And so those are extraordinary circumstances. I've never had to do it, uh, but I suspect at some point in my ministry that will become something of a necessity. I know men who have. And so we're just trying to give clarity to our presbytery as to what the confession is teaching here historically and what has been the historic practice. And that would be what I would advocate as the practice that we should, we should follow. Now, the confession goes on to talk about this denial of the cup to the people. Of course, that was a problem uh, under, uh, um, within Roman Catholicism. But we know from Matthew 26 and verses 27 and 28 that the Lord Jesus Christ did not restrict the cup from his disciples. And we are his disciples. Uh, we are the followers of Christ and the the cup that represents the atoning work, the blood of Christ that atones for my sin, should not be withheld from me by any means. There was a whole bunch of superstitious reasons why Rome would withhold the cup from the people. Um, but suffice it to say, that this whole idea of denying the cup and only giving the bread to the worshiper is ridiculous. Uh, both elements are to be given to the worshiper because the worshiper needs, indeed, needs the broken body of Christ and the blood of Christ that atones for sin. The other thing it mentions here is this whole idea of adoring the elements, worshiping the elements, lifting them about, carrying them around, parading them about as some, in some superstitious ideology, superstitious manner that somehow gives more credence to the elements than they ought to be given. Remember, they are ordinary elements. They are bread and wine. There's nothing uh, magical about them. We pray for God's blessing that he set the use of them apart for, a, for, uh, for that which is not common but holy. But those elements are not any more holy than they were uh, before the worship service began. Um, and so we don't do any of this, this ridiculous type of behavior to somehow accentuate the idea that they're um, somehow... Uh, uh, more sacred or, or, or other uh, than what they really are. And we don't reserve them for any pretended religious use. I remember once I was coming out of the pulpit at the end of the, Lord, at the, end of the worship service after pronouncing the benediction and the bread was sitting there and I was hungry and I grabbed the piece and I ate it. And there was a child close by and saw me do that and was kind of aghast, I guess, by such an activity. And it was an opportunity for me to teach the child that there's nothing sacred about this. Uh, this is just bread. And the worship service is over. I'm not denigrating it. I'm not, uh, I'm not treating it poorly. Uh, and I'm certainly not treating it with any superstition. It is simply bread. I do that all the time. I frequently do that uh, now. Um, and so we don't reserve these elements in some way, as some in some superstitious way that... Um, regards them as other than what they are. And so it's really, all of it is contrary to the very nature of the sacrament. You remember when the meal was administered by the Lord Jesus Christ, it was done at the Passover meal. The, the elements were sitting there on the table. He made use of those elements to institute the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So these things are contrary to the nature of the sacrament and to the institution of it that Christ gives. So, a couple of major issues here in this paragraph. First, we don't, do private, we don't do private administrations of the Lord's Supper. I don't go to someone's home and do it just with the individual. You don't do it on your own either, by the way. Uh, you don't uh, get a bottle of wine and some bread and, and dads. You, you do, you're not authorized to administer the Lord's Supper. It's outside of the bounds of which Christ instituted it. Uh, that is reserved for a minister of the gospel. We don't do private masses. We don't do private... Uh, uh, 
celebrations of the Lord's Supper. It's done within the confines of worship, whether public or public in the sense of in someone's home or a nursing home or whatnot. And we don't celebrate the elements in some superstitious manner uh, and, and doing all sorts of odd behavior when it comes to these, to these things. Well, I trust these times are helpful for you. I hope they are. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave me a note. The way to reach me is there before you on the screen. And so until the Friday edition, when we consider paragraph uh, number five, may the Lord help you today. May you walk according to his word. God bless.